Well, this, the verse that, that struck me as we came, came to this final of our four dips into the letter to the Philippi church was the passage about gentleness. And I've used that as the image on the cover of the leaflet today. Uh, I found on the internet this image which highlights in someone's Bible the words, let your gentleness be known to all, the Lord is near. So I, I, it was those words that caught my eye. And, uh, and uh, I've headed our, our, uh, our meditation, uh, gentle and joyful in Christ. But I realized uh, that if I was starting again, I would probably be looking, say, suggesting that we're looking into the heart of the apostle here. You remember from our first chapter, we discovered he's in jail. He's in lockdown. Uh, in our second chapter, he reflects about Christ coming to us, leaving the glory, stepping down, stepping into the human arena, stepping into poverty, stepping into mortality and death on a cross. That's what he did. He stepped down. Uh, God raised him up. This is what God approves. And so as we look at our world, it's changed by these events which his heart has been unfolding to the people. And, uh, and today we come then to his uh, final words to the church, written from lockdown, as it were, literally. And the, the things I want to touch on, and I won't be elaborating in great detail, but I want to talk about the urge the urgent call to rejoice. Uh, he says it twice. Uh, he says gentleness is important. These words that I've already alluded to. Let your gentleness be known to all people. The Lord is near. Then he says that they should be practical in prayer if there are things they need. Bring their requests to God. Why do we need that urging? Let's think about that. And he says that your minds be full. There are certain things that are going to benefit us and we, we want to think about what he puts before them there before finally he says, what you've learned, do that and be guarded by God. So let's just look at these points as we work through these verses which Amanda has read. In fact, Amanda read from the very beginning which, which picked up the names of two women, Euodia and Syntyche. And we gather that these women have had a falling out. But Paul is concerned that they be reconciled. They were his fellow workers. They helped with him in the spread of the gospel in Philippi. They were his co-workers, he says. He says their names with the others, like Clement, are in the book of life. Uh, but they've had a disagreement. And it's important in the family, in the Christian family, in our church congregations, that people not be chipping away at one another, but be building one another up. And so he says uh, to bring to the reader, perhaps it's uh, uh, Epaphroditus who is taking the letter back to them, uh, draw near to these women and, and encourage them, help them in this business of being reconciled. To see mutual concern among the believers is important. Be concerned for one another. And so with that in mind as the background, this dear, dear group of people, as he's reflecting on his time with them all those years before, we're going to think about rejoice. Now as we do this, joy is the natural response to the gospel because the gospel is good news. Gospel is about God being for us, not against us. How is it that we get this idea that God is against us and is hounding us all the time? Now, God is for us. He has loved us. He has sent his son to redeem us. And the natural response is joy. And so the apostle says it. He says it in every uh, chapter of this letter. Joy and rejoicing come in. And here he says, I'll say it again. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Now, I'm guessing that of everybody who normally comes to this church, that verse is pretty well known. And there would be some of us who sang it as youngsters in Sunday schools. 
And there's a version by the Fisher Folk, which I'm going to play, which uh, might bring it back. It's not in the style that we would traditionally in our reserved Presbyterian ways would indulge in, but listen to the Fisher Folk as they bring it to us. I hope that brought back some memories at different camps, singing it as a round, learning to uh, express some joy and exuberance. And we must remember that Psalm 150 invites us to do this big time. Uh, It invites all the instruments of the orchestra that they had, including, I would say, the percussion instruments uh, and uh, indeed dancing as well. So... Let's remember that these are ways in which the human family expresses joy and rejoicing and uh, nothing can alter the truth that God has loved us. And this isn't a song for children. This is a song for adults. We are united with Christ by faith. And that union is symbolized in our baptism, baptized into Christ, so that he is mine and I am his. And when God looks on me, He sees me in Christ. And that expression, in Christ, in the Lord Jesus, occurs four times uh, in this chapter. So he's thinking about the church being gathered in Christ. Christ is who binds us together. He is our risen king. Our mission is to make him known in the world. But how? How can we do that, small as we are? How could it be asked of the church in Philippi? Well, notice what Paul says next. Let your gentleness be known to all. The Lord is near. Are we known for our gentleness? This is an interesting question. If not, what words might we use to characterize ourselves or our church? Are we on the money? Are we accurate? Are we truthful? Are we outgoing and reaching into the community? There are lots of ways churches like to be known. But gentleness is a little bit soft. And is that what we want? What do we mean by gentleness? Well, God in the Bible is known as gentle. <laughs> Let me just take you right back to the beginning. I think we often get this wrong because we think of the God of the Old Testament as fierce and angry. But here is how God speaks to Moses in Exodus 34 at the Mount The Ten Commandments have been smashed when Moses came down the mountain and saw the people reveling and yearning to be back to the gods of Egypt. But now God has reissued the commandments. And this is what God says. These are the words put into the mouth of God. God, God, a God of mercy and grace, endlessly patient, so much love, so deeply true, Loyal in love for a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion, and sin. Still, he doesn't ignore sin. He looks, he holds sons and grandsons responsible for a father's sins to the third and even the fourth generation. That is to say, our sins affect the next generation. There's a generational impact for for our wayward behavior. But here it is. God is endlessly patient, loving, generous, loyal in love to a thousand generations. The idea of loyal love 
is a special word in the Hebrew Bible, chesed, and it's, it's the word which, which brings together uh, both lo the loyalty and uh, a pledged love is really perhaps the best way to think about it. It's the kind of love that should undergird a marriage, pledged love. Something more robust than just a loving feeling, uh, but something uh, more loving than just a contract. Pledged love, loyal love. And, and as if to emphasize the, the uh, change here, uh, Isaiah picks up the judgment of God and he, he says the Lord will rise up, this is Isaiah 28 as you can see, the Lord will rise up as he did at Mount Perizim, he will rouse himself as he did in the valley of Gibeon, he will do his work, his strange work and perform his task, his alien task. Now what is God's strange work? What is God's alien task? It is judgment. This is not what God likes. God has no delight in, in, in uh, judgment. <coughs> this is his strange work. If we then were to read on in Isaiah, we would find the image of the shepherd emerging. He will shepherd his flock. Uh, this is the tenderness of the love of Yahweh for his people. And so... Isaiah picks up this in chapter 40 onwards. We get a huge emphasis on this gentleness. And of course that brings us to Jesus. Let's just think about that for a moment as we read our New Testaments. Uh, we get Jesus, he's strong, uh, he's robust. He's been a carpenter most of his life. He's used to working with his hands. He takes on if people are hostile he, he, he moves out of difficult situations. He has a deep relationship with God. He's gentle to those around. And he, he is, uh, sometime before he's depicted in art, the earliest art we have depicting Jesus is uh, a Syrian scene depicting somebody healing a paralyzed man and the paralyzed man going away with his, with his bed. So that was one of the stories that touched somebody in Syria. But this piece of art on the, on the uh, screen at the moment, this is a depiction of Jesus. It's a third century fresco, so it's painted in wet plaster uh, from the catacomb of Calixtus in Rome. And it shows Christ as the good shepherd, the Isaiah image, the John 10 picture. I am the good shepherd. It's a beardless Christ. Christ is not depicted with a beard until the 4th century. And then, of course, the Byzantine, the powerful images of uh, Byzantine Christ, uh, uh, they, they pick up the beard all the time and de depict Christ as all-powerful and strong. But Christ came among us gently, and we need to remember that. He gathers uh, the, the, uh, the children, you remember, when the disciples felt that he had, would have no time for it because he was tired. He gathered the children. Gentleness, said Jesus. Uh, uh, gentleness, said the Apostle Paul, was the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And uh, it matters to Paul because this gentleness that he's asking for the uh, Philippians to exhibit, this is a display of Christ-likeness. This is God-likeness. I came across this book title this week, the Allure of Gentleness. It's by Dallas Willard, whom I've heard about but not read before. And he, it's subtitled, Defending the Faith in the Manner of Jesus. And we need to remember that Jesus communicated gentleness. You read the Beatitudes and see what he's commending there. You look how he treated the poor, the hungry, the sick, the maimed. And curiously, and I don't think I've got to the bottom of this, but it says, let your gentleness be known to all. The Lord is near. And the question is, what does he mean by saying that? Does he mean the return of the Lord is near? Or does he mean that spatially there is a sense in which Christ is present? And I, I think that we have to connect that gentleness to the Lord's presence. 
in a sense, when we are what we should be, we will discover Christ is nearer in our lives because we are embodying him. Are we embodying him? That is the question. Well, perhaps we've got a long way to go. And so the third thing I want to turn to is to be practical in our prayers. Now, Jesus has taught us how to pray. He's given us the encouragement in this letter to pray. Uh, the Philippian church was surrounded by hostile culture and the many concerns of daily living uh, could easily overwhelm people with anxiety. But he says, connect them to your prayers. Come to God with prayer. And we have a pattern of prayer. And if you've been with us uh, on a previous uh, uh, stream service, you know we always turn to the Lord's Prayer. Not that it has any magic power, but it reminds us of a pattern of prayer into which we can slip our own prayers. The prayer Jesus gave us, you remember, has six petitions. Your name, your kingdom, your will. Give us, forgive us, and deliver us. The first three, all about God. We should begin our prayers with God. Not, it's not absolutely essential. The very fact of prayer reminds us that we come to God. And there are prayers in the Bible that begin right where we are right now. But when we come deliberately and contemplatively in prayer, we should remind ourselves of the greatness of the God who has loved us like this. And then, of course, we come into the picture. Sooner or later, it's our, our petitions, our prayers. And so we, we, we're thinking about the, the details of our lives, our loved ones. Uh, and so the prayer begins with our daily bread. How down to earth can you be in a world where a billion people have no food security? Can you imagine how that prayer is prayed in, uh, in desperate areas of the world. And forgive us. As we go on in life, perhaps uh, we become more aware of ways in which we need forgiving for all the damage done and deliver us. We realize that there are forces at work in our world that will not help liberate people, but indeed enslave us. So give, forgive, and deliver become key important aspects of our prayers. But he is more than prayer. He wants us to actually be mindful, to fill our minds with certain things, and to do it actively. Um, there's a lot of talk about mindfulness and a great deal of literature about it. And there's no doubt that our minds uh, are, are totally amazing. It's in the, in the years in which I've been a Christian minister, the study of the brain has just taken leaps and bounds. We know what parts of the brain do. We, we know about the neural networks in the brain. We know about plasticity. There's been massive work done on stroke research. And, uh, and so there is so much about our minds. Not, I'm not suggest, don't want to suggest that the, the brain, which is about a pint, 600 mils in size, uh, is coterminous with our minds because our minds can go way outside and we have amazing imaginative power. And we need to use that imaginative power. Mindfulness. So in, ad in addition to our prayers, the apostle reminds us to fill our minds with the things that will help us. In uh, Eugene Peterson's translation, he says this, summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'll do better by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious. The best, not the worst. The beautiful, not the ugly. Things to praise, not things to curse. So we're challenged here. We're challenged what we listen to, what we watch, what we read, our conversations are challenged. So many things are challenged. And in those moments when we have uh, disposable time, when we're not busy with the things that we have to do in our daily lives, we need to be able to 
take time to dwell on the things that are true and beautiful and deserve uh, high repute and praise. So what takes up the space in your mind? What is your mind full of? If it's anxiety, then pray. If you want to prepare yourself for a new day, think about these things, says the Apostle. This is a great passage from this text. But then he says, uh, my heading here is simply do it. God is on guard. What, why have I said that? Well, the apostle comes to the end of this passage that we've read and he says, action is needed. You've learned things. You've seen, you've heard, you know what my life was about when I was with you. And, and so he says, do these things, do it. And he says, and this is a, a second passage from this small selection of verses which has become renowned. He says, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. Now, what does, what does that really mean? Well, the image of guarding, you, you remember back at the beginning we said that Philippi was a Roman colony. They were used to having ex-servicemen around the place. The Philippian jailer was probably an ex-serviceman. The city would be a walled city and there would be guards on duty. And he uses a word for a guard on duty. And who is the guard on duty? God is the guard. God is your guardian. He will guard your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of Christ. The peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. You can go to sleep in a city when you know the city is safe. We can go to sleep in our homes when we know the home is safe. We're invited to trust that in, those, uh, in all of life, God guards us because he regards us as precious in his sight. Like a sentry on a city wall in guard duty, God will lovingly guard them. He will guard your life, what you learned, what you heard, what you saw, what you realized. Do it, he said. God is your guard your security. Do it. So that's our challenge. May God bless his med- this meditation on his word and to his name be the glory and the praise. I'm going to invite Amanda to come forward again and just to play for us as we reflect on these things.
Thank you, Amanda. I couldn't help thinking as uh, you were playing that uh, the way Eugene Peterson translates the peace of God, uh, he says, the God who makes everything work together will work you into his most excellent harmonies. Imagine being worked into the symphony that God is creating. There's a whole new creation taking place. And Jesus is the first fruits of that creation. And those who model themselves on him, who follow in his way, who trust in him, discover that God will work their, him, them into his most excellent harmonies. So we come in prayer. I want to lead you in prayer now. It's been an amazing week in some ways, as Christine hinted at the outset, and uh, want to begin uh, with thinking about uh, the challenges that the world has faced and those that we ourselves face. So let us unite our hearts as we pray. Heavenly Father, we love the beauty and rich diversity of the planet on which we live. Yet we come before you with a sadness and lamentation that of all your creatures, it is we, your human family, that have soiled the earth. We need your redemption. We are aware of deep divisions and tensions among the world's peoples, which at any time in any given place exposes itself in unjust incarceration, violence and brutality. We yearn for the protection, perfection and beauty of your new creation. Give our leaders wisdom as they make decisions regarding our safety and well-being. We know the Lord Jesus stepped down and into the breach for a wayward humanity, even to death on a cross and that he became by that death and his resurrection the first fruits of a whole new world, a world created by redeeming love. Help us to reflect that redeeming love into the world of our day. By your Holy Spirit, please work the peace and gentleness of our Lord into our lives. Help us to fill our minds with those things that are true, noble, reputable, authentic, compelling, gracious. The best, not the worst. The beautiful, not the ugly. Things to praise, not things to curse. As Christ draws us closer, help us to rejoice in the wonder of your love. Guide us in our prayers. We pray for women, girls and Western sympathizers in Afghanistan. Show mercy to this troubled and frightened people there. Protect those who are in great danger, Christians and other minorities, women and girls, and all who worked with Western forces and the previous government. Today we also pray for Tajikistan to the north of Afghanistan, where oppressive laws make Christian worship difficult and even dangerous. Keep watch over all your people. As we have been enduring lockdown, we're mindful of the many frontline healthcare workers who are at risk of COVID infection and of burnout. Keep them safe day by day and speed the vaccine rollout so that the whole community can enjoy protection. Support all whose mental health is at risk. Guide parents with children on school holidays it's been good to hear of the kindness to strangers that was so generously evident in the Newfoundland community at Gander 20 years ago. Thank you that the gratitude continues to be expressed in the scholarships for young people and celebrated in the music and dance of theatre. We remember those who mourn, the frail, elderly and sick this morning. Bring encouragement to them and hope as we now commit them to you in the silence of our hearts.
So many come to mind, Lord. We do lift them to you and we ask that you will help them to cast their care on you and to know that you care for them even if we are not able to express because of lockdown the concern we feel. We ask that in the name of him who taught us to pray together and say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Well, may God bless you, uh, and uh, may this week, uh, may you know his presence in your life day by day, and his strength. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, Rest upon and remain with each one of us and with those whom we love, now and always. Amen.